Uh, next, we've got uh, Dr. Jamie Craggs. Um, he's a fantastic aquarist and a uh, really nice all-around guy. I've worked with him in the past. And uh, several years ago, he took our notions of coral spawning in aquariums and blew them out of the water by actually making it happen and figuring out ways to show the rest of us how to do it. Uh, today, he's going to be talking about LPS corals. I know you have a, you have a surprise. So um, he's going to be talking about some recent advancements that he has done. And so please, uh, this is the, probably the future of the hobby as things happen, is we're going to need to spawn our own corals. So please welcome Jamie Craggs. Um, thanks, uh, thanks for that introduction. Thank you for inviting me here to speak. Um, it's great being back at a, uh, an in-person conference after a couple of dark years. Um, so I'm going to talk yeah, about um, some work that I've been up to the last couple of years. Uh, I thought I'd give a little overview of where, you know, what, what's happened in the last 10 years that's got me to this point focus on some of the LPS spawning, and then try and um, give you a sense of how I think ex situ spawning will play a role in, um, you know, in the industry in the future. Um, OK, so um, I work at a museum in southeast London. Um, I'm principal curator, so I run a public aquarium. Um, and about 10 years ago, I tasked myself with the challenge of being able to spawn corals in a really planned way in an aquarium environment. And if we can do that in a planned way, and we know when the corals are going to spawn, does that then open up lots and lots of sort of opportunities for research and, and so on and so forth? So 10 years ago, it was pretty rudimentary, the design, um, but it built this sort of... Um, blackout system with really, really cheap building materials. Um, and within eight months, I had the first spawning of a cropper. So I really knew I was onto something at this point. And then from that, um, the system design sort of got um, reworked several times. And I published this paper about five years ago, which was what we, we call our Mark III version of the spawning system. And it fundamentally, it, it, you know, it looks like anyone's uh, home aquarium. It's got a sump, skimmer, refugium. Uh, an apex um, is attached to it. And then ultimately, if you put in all the seasonality, uh, the corals then start um, you know, picking up on that seasonality and behaving in a, in a natural way and, and spawn in a predictable manner. Um, so you know, the, the, the apex allows you to obviously replicate things like seasonal temperature change, photo period, um, and then the lunar cycle. And we know all those three uh, parameters are really important in triggering the corals to reproduce in this fairly small window of time. So you may have an acropora, it's gonna take 20 minutes to release its eggs and sperm once a year. So you have to know when that 20 minute window is. Uh, to be able to do all the work that, that's going on. And, and having all this seasonality in place is fundamental to that predictability. Um, yeah, I should say, I mean, ultimately, I end up running this experiment and lots of others around spawning, and that, that was the focus of my PhD. Um, after my PhD, myself, um, Professor Mike Sweet and, and Vince Thomas, we co-founded the Coral Spawning Lab. And the idea, we did this two years ago, and the idea is we wanted to start building systems that would allow lots of other people to do this, uh, other researchers or reef restoration practitioners. So I don't know whether, the, yeah, on the, on the top uh, is what we call our off-the-shelf systems, and we've designed these so that they can be built in London, crated up, and then sent wherever they need to go around the world. And so we've built them so they'll, they'll fit through a standard doorway, they arrive, the client then unpackages them, uh, bolts them together, fills them up with water, and, and roughly off, the, off they go. So you know, one section is our broodstock conditioning, and then attached to that is an embryo rearing uh, settlement and grow out um, sort of component to it. And then we took that uh, design a step further, and then started building systems uh, in, in a shipping container, which we call our lab in the box. And so these can be configured in different ways. They can even have two, three, or four spawning systems. So then when you start phase shifting, you can have up to four spawns a year. Dramatically increases your sort of access to material. 
and then you know, obviously build on the productivity by having access to material more frequently. And the, the sort of principle behind this was that you know, if these are going out to the tropics where there's hurricanes and things, you, know, you can bolt these down or just simply pick the whole uh, shipping container up and, and move it somewhere secure. So these are the sort of thought processes behind it. And we really sort of regard these systems as a, as a bit like a, labor, a piece of laboratory equipment. You know, you, uh, a research facility may spend you know, half a million dollars on an on a electron microscope to study one specific aspect of a research program. These are sort of you know, a similar thing that they're a tool uh, to facilitate uh, lots of that research, basically. Um, and you know, we, we've put a number of these systems around the world. Around 60 now have gone into different locations around the world. And clients will use those for, for whatever means that, they, you know, that they've purchased it for. Often it's around uh, research, pure research, uh, understanding things like underlying mechanisms of genetics. You know, the big question with climate change is, you know, are corals going to survive into the future? You know, how do we start breeding more resilient corals? So some uh, people are interested in those, the underlying mechanisms, the genetic mechanisms that make some individuals resilient against some of these, these thermal stress events over others. And then other um, uh, work is, is purely about restoration. So how do we sexually um, uh, spawn corals? Uh, we're then creating genetically diverse individuals with the hope that uh, a number of those have that resilience within them. And then when you plant those out onto the reef, you're building that resilience uh, for, the, for the future. So um, the systems themselves are the, the sort of um, foundation that allow lots and lots of spawning work to, to take place. And then, like I say, once the spawning is predictable, you can build your research strategy around it. So we've spawned now, I think, about 35 species. Um, predominantly, we're focusing on acroperids in the early days, but now sort of expanding that out. Um, and really, I kind of try and view it like this, that ex situ spawning is the sort of broader umbrella of um, this sort of new approach. And then fitting within that, you have these sort of three areas that your research can, can sit in. Um, one is just simply understanding the fundamentals of reproductive biology. There is still so much we don't understand about coral reproduction. There's obviously thousands of species, and very few of those have been mapped out. So there's just some basic natural history and uh, you know, uh, reproductive life history strategy to, uh, to work through. Um, yeah, and things like what we know about acroprids, you know, there can be hybridization that goes on between species. What are the parameters that, that sort of allow that hybridization to take place or not? So these are some of the questions we can start answering around the fundamentals. Another area is about um, how do we increase productivity? So in order to make reef restoration happen at a much bigger scale, we have to answer some of these questions about you know, how do we take these millions and millions of gametes that are released and start producing tens of thousands of corals, not hundreds of corals from these spawning events. And so there's lots and lots of bottlenecks in the coral's um, life history that we need to start understanding what those bottlenecks are and then developing new methodologies, husbandry techniques, that we can alleviate those bottlenecks and start building that productivity. And then the, the final area is, is, you know, ex situ spawning has this completely unique power. We are not having to rely on going and diving on a reef where storm damage can, or storms can come through, making it difficult to get on um, you know, into the water and collect these gametes. Once we've understood what is triggering this, these spawning events and taking control of that, we can manipulate it at lots of different timescales. Um, so I'm going I'm to finish up the talk with uh, you know, some of these unique potentials, I think. Um, after my PhD, I wanted to... I didn't have a tank at home, and uh, so I thought I'd start spawning corals in my kitchen and teaching my children how to do it. So a lot of these next few slides has been done in my kitchen. So the take-home message is you can do this at home. Um, so you know, my, my friend Vince, uh, Vince Thomas built this system for me. It's um, I'm bad at converting things into gallons, but it's a 700 liter uh, tank. It's predominantly, you know, it's a, a display tank, but we designed it so that we could do some spawning work within it. Um, and I think we've spawned nine species at home, so the boys have been able to, um, 
you know, collect gametes from the corals, do fertilization in the, you know, sort of washing up bowls and stuff on the kitchen table, and they get to see all the eggs developing and this, you know, the cells dividing and things like that. And it's just been a great engagement uh, opportunity. Spawning is one of those natural wonders of the world, and, and to be able to do it at home has been, uh, it's been great, but it's also really interesting to approach it in a domestic setting compared to a lab. You know, there's lots of different things that you can't do that you would do in a lab, but, um, but it is much easier than having to travel to the lab. So it's good from that perspective. So the, the system uh, that I've got at home, uh, basically there's a, an SPS uh, display tank, uh, and then this small side tank is where I keep all the LPS corals. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's using, it, it doesn't look any different to most people's home aquariums, really. You know, it's, it's got all the same types of filtration in. Um, you know, I run the system on the Triton method. I do a lot of um, individual trace element dosing on a daily basis. Um, the, uh, the alkalinity is controlled with alkatronic, dosatronic combination. There's a, an apex um, just in the corner here where all the seasonality is programmed. So I've programmed the system to replicate um, reefs in the southern part of the Great Barrier Reef, an area called Halfway Island, uh, which is in the Keppels region, which is quite south. And this is one of the main collection areas of where the LPS, things like homophilias and, and the ACANs that we see coming in from the trade, they come from this area. Um, so in the yellow line, you'll see the, um, the, the photo period. So this is number of minutes of sunlight in a day. And then the blue line is, um, is, is that temperature profile. Now what's quite interesting is it gets really cold in these areas. So down to about 19 degrees, which I think is about 66 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's, it, they are cold areas of the world. Um, this was the initial profile that I put on the system. And I found something really interesting. Actually, the SPS corals, absolutely cannot handle getting that cold. So I got a lot of cold water bleaching uh, in the system as a result of it. I lost some Montiporas, they, they literally just keeled over. Um, so what I've ended up having to do is actually take the bottom uh, off the, the lowest part of the temperature profile. And so I, I sit at about 22 degrees as the minimum. So what is that, 71 degrees Fahrenheit or something? That's, that's the sort of maximum or minimum I take it down to. But understanding basically this, this uh, photo period change and this temperature profile, and then when you overlay the lunar cycle onto it, it's those three parameters that allow you to then judge when a spawning event is gonna occur. This doesn't happen everywhere in the world, but it's, it's, a, it's a reasonably good um, gauge to, to be able to predict when a spawning is gonna happen. Because we're looking at the temperature rise and the photo period rise, and then ultimately the number of nights after the full moon. And so from that, you can then predict when a spawning event is going to happen by looking at those three parameters. Like I say, it doesn't work everywhere. Um, the Great Barrier Reef, it's, it, this is how it works. So you can use this model really well. The, what we, we're doing some work in the Maldives at the moment. We, we're starting to understand there's a really different pattern in the Maldives where we see different species spawning at different times of the year. So you actually get lots of spawning in the Maldives. Uh, and so this type of approach wouldn't work with Maldivian corals. Um, so lighting, um, the main display has um, Gen 4s on and then ReefBright XHOs. And then these are programmed by um, the, the Apex to simulate that change in the photo period throughout the year. And it's around 250 micromoles. But I then run the LPS tank really, really quite dark. Um, so I hit about um, 32 micromoles. So it's, it's quite a dark um, tank. It's got a, a Gen 5 above it. So the Gen 5 is on the LPS um, Ecotech profile, whereas the main tank's on the AB Plus uh, profile. And you know, I think the combination in terms of long-term health of LPS is keeping that temperature profile nice and cool, low light level and low flow. I mean, that's what I've personally found to be the ingredients to, to sort of uh, make that work. And then the lunar, the lunar module uh, on there as well. So there's, there's three lunar lights on there. So actually from the photo period, the, the Gen 5s, I've not managed to program the seasonality on that, but there's actually a little gap in between the, the main display tank and the LPS. So when the, the Gen 5 turns off, you've still got light spill coming in there. So in that way, it kind of replicates the photo period change 
It's about as rudimentary or crude as I could get it. So once um, we sort of start getting into spawning season, the, this big blackout um, blind gets put up. Uh, I don't think my wife's going to allow me to do it this year. She's had two years of the, the kitchen being turned into a lab. Um, but this blackout blind gets put over. Uh, and the whole idea of this blackout blind is we want to control the light-dark environment. What we know is really important to get corals to spawn is the, the period of when the sun sets and then the period of absolute darkness that as we move past the full moon extends by broadly sort of 48 minutes each night. And it's that period of absolute darkness that the corals are basically regulating their, their genes to. And so if we interrupt that period of darkness, we'll completely break up the spawning behavior. And this is why things like coastal development um, starts breaking down spawning synchronicity um, and really is, is incredibly damaging to the future of reefs. There's a lot of research looking at how street lights are changing from sodium lamps to LEDs, is putting the, uh, pushing the sort of light spectrum into the blue range, which the corals are much more sensitive to. And that could have massive implications in, in sort of the slow demise of a reef if the reproduction uh, potential is, is, is inhibited. That's a whole nother story. So, like I said, I've been focusing on, uh, on uh, acropids for, for a, a long time, but this has been my holy grail for, for a while, um, trying to spawn scollies, Homophilia australis. Um, I absolutely have to thank Tropical Marine Center. Uh, Derek Thompson is a good friend, um, uh, works at Tropical Marine Center, and he sources the broodstock for me, gives me a lot of information about where the collectors have, have taken uh, the individuals from, which allows me to then find data, uh, environmental data, from that location. And so this has been a bit of a personal um, sort of challenge to, to try and spawn them and, and rear them and understand something about their reproductive biology. There's nothing in the literature about how these guys reproduce, so it was uh, sort of starting right at the beginning. Now, normally with acroporids, what you would do is you would break a branch off and you would look through the cross-section and you see the eggs uh, developing inside. And they start off really white and, and small, and then as they get bigger, ultimately they'll become pigmented. Once you see pigmented in, uh, eggs inside a, an acropora, that is gonna spawn after the next full moon. And then all you've gotta do is count the number of days after the full moon, have some understanding of when it spawns after sunset, and that gives you your window of time when to collect the gametes. Now the problem with, um, obviously scollies, is you can't fragment them, or you can, but they won't live afterwards. So I, um, I had this sort of personal goal of I wanted to try and figure this out. It costs a lot of money, and it's quite a painful process, because you buy a scolly, you break it in half, and then you preserve it. And it just feels like you're burning $100 bills as soon as it arrives, which is, which is horrible. Um, so I specifically asked Derek, actually, to just get me the brownest or plainest looking scollies because they're just going to get killed the second they arrive. But this is fundamental. You have to do this to then understand something about its reproductive biology. And so what you're seeing in this picture here is this, uh, this scolly has been uh, broken in half, and I've split it, and you're looking from the underside, and so that's the, uh, the mouth. Where am I? Uh, the mouth is down here and then you're looking uh, through the sort of broken skeleton. And what we can see is you have eggs and sperm uh, developing inside. So this is the first piece of the puzzle. This is what's called a, a hermaphroditic broadcast spawner. It's the main reproductive mode of corals, but we now know something about how they spawn from that simple fragment. So they have both sexes within a single polyp. These were then uh, preserved, and um, a, a colleague and friend ran some um, histology for me. And so I'm going to try and describe it. So in uh, C, this sort of area here that is a bit pale, this is where the skeleton was. So what we've done is we've melted the skeleton away, and what we've done is replace the skeleton with agar. And the agar kind of holds the soft structure in place in the same way that it would... Um, being held in place by, by the skeleton. And so when you break a scolly in half, you have the scepter, which are like fingers. And then ultimately, the gametes are developing in between the scepter. So, and what, the eggs develop on the bottom, and then the sperm is developing on top. 
And so you can vaguely see that by this would be where the scepter is. And then these pink areas, uh, this is the, the egg developing, and that's the sperm developing on top of it. And so uh, what it does look like as well, the mouth is just the middle. There's a sort of barren zone underneath the mouth. And, but then moving out away from the uh, mouth, you've then got the eggs developing in the, uh, the sort of indentations around the septum. And so one of the things I wanted to look at was first, you know, what time do they spawn? And then I wanted to learn something about the embryo development of the species and then start looking at things like the settlement and how quickly they can grow on. So the next few slides are going to kind of talk you through that process. So you've got a, a scully here. This is setting. So this is the process where it's releasing its egg sperm package. One polyp releases one very large bundle, and that's it. For And it literally lasts about, I don't know, two seconds, and that's it. Spawning is done for the year. So you really need to understand when that is. And basically, there's a, a slide later on which you can see this a bit easier, but all that I've done is, is um, pulled a number of these polyps in a bucket that has a mesh around the outside, and that's floating at the surface of the tank. And so I've pulled all those together. And these were a mixture of, I think I had three spawn that were newly imported about two months before. So they'd already started their whole process of, um, of developing their gametes was taking place in the wild. And then one polyp up here, this is one that I'd uh, kept for about uh, 15 months. So it's gone through its full gametogenic cycle uh, in, in the aquarium. And again, that's telling us something that we can actually spawn uh, these corals in long-term uh, sort of management. And then ultimately what I did during spawning, I didn't preserve the, the bundle because only f four were released, one from each polyp. Um, but then I stayed up and took a sample every hour uh, to preserve the embryological development and then run scanning electron microscopy. So these next few slides are going to sort of talk you through the embryo stage, uh, stages of them. So the first thing that happens is the bundle sort of breaks apart and it releases the eggs and the sperm are separated out. So this sort of messy looking uh, structure around here, you've got the eggs and then the sperm is being liberated out and you can see the sperm cells breaking away there. Um, you then end up with an egg, uh, which is nice and clean, there's no sperm on the surface. And then you have fertilization. So this is the, the, the process obviously of of uh, one sperm winning the race and, and uh, fertilizing that, that nucleus. And generally, I leave, uh, you know, we normally leave uh, fertilization to take place over about 45 minutes to an hour. After that time, then the flow gets turned on in the bucket and it's washing all that sperm away to keep the eggs nice and clean. And then about two hours later, you start seeing the first cell division. So what's happening here is, is there's a nucleus, the nucleus is dividing uh, b between here and then we're going into what's called our two-cell blastomere. So this is a, a two-cell embryo. Um, from there, it then goes and divides into four cells. We then go into eight cells, 16 cells. It goes up to 32, 64, and so on and so forth. And then when we get to uh, past 100 cells, we, we call this a morula now. Um, and what you'll notice is the morula, um, it's not a huge amount bigger than the original egg that was released. So it's not like the embryo is growing massive. All that's happening is the cell is actually dividing, getting smaller and smaller. So you know th this is separated by about eight hour, well, maybe a bit more, about 10 hour difference. Um, and it's only about double the size of the original egg that was released. Um, from that, it starts forming something called the bowl stage. And this is the process of blastulation. Um, that then um, starts curling up and forms the round stage. This is a gastrulation now. And this is when the gut, uh, ultimately, of the polyp is going to be formed. So as it, it closes up, and then you have the oral pole left uh, as a tiny little dot. Um, they then come into something called the teardrop stage. If I mean, the orientation of this is wrong, but ultimately, the mouth of the, the polyp is, is formed in there. And then it elongates to um, form the planula larvae. And these guys are motile at this stage. So this is about um, 36 hours at the pair stage, and then you're at 48 hours. You're already at the larvae. It's swimming around. Once it hits the larvae stage, it then starts settling um, 
and forming the primary polyp. So this, again, is the mouth in the, in the middle of the primary polyp, and these lumps here are where the tentacles are going to form of the polyp eventually. And so when you put all of that together, Yeah, when you put all that together, you then um, sort of map out the embryological development of, of this species for the first time. So we now know it's a hermaphroditic broadcast spawner. Um, it takes about two days uh, to get to a planted larvae. So it's much, much quicker than a croprids. Normally, that's about four days. So it's about twice the speed. And the thought is, actually, the smaller the egg, the faster the larvae um, it takes them to get to the larvae because they, they're just working through that cell division quicker. Um, from that, then settled um, uh, a proportion of them. I'm not going to present the sort of data that we collected here, but it was looking at you know, settlement preferences and, and what have you. I'm, I'm writing up the paper on this, and it will be published open access, so everyone will be able to sort of view uh, you know, the information about this and hopefully try to do it at home as well. But after a, year, um, a month, you, they're already taken up the zooxanthellae. They're still very small at this stage. Um, they start getting pigmented by about uh, three months. They just look like a green aptasia at this point. Um, grow a little bit more. It's by about eight months, they're starting to look a little bit more like a, um, you know, a homophilia. And then they start growing pretty rapidly at this point, which has really surprised me. One of the questions is, you know, how long does it take for a scholly to get to, you know, a cell, a cell uh, you know, a marketable size? Well, I, I think this actually is showing some really encouraging speed of, of growth and development. So this picture I took um, just last week, um, and it's, it's about uh, 25 mil across at this point. It's a little bit... Um, potentially slightly misleading in the fact that, you know, I think anyone that keeps LPS knows that in the morning they're about this big and in the afternoon they're about this big. So there is a lot of fluctuation um, from, from the size that they can change, um, you know, from, from day to night. And so there it is, you know, you manage to settle them, grow them out. And I think there's a huge amount of potential to this. And, and speaking with colleagues in Australia, they're going to be picking this up and looking at doing this at a much larger scale. You know, I can't, you know, in the UK, all um, uh, exports from Australia, uh, certainly the East Coast, have been banned now, so we can't get any more brood stock. So the stuff that I've got is the stuff that I'm going to continue working with, but um, it's up to others to, to hopefully pick up the mantle and move forward with it. Um, lots of people sort of ask about health, how to keep um, LPS corals alive long term. Some of them can be quite challenging. Um, I think you know, temperature is, is definitely one of those really important driving factors to keep them nice and cool. But I stumbled, or actually one of my acrists at, at work uh, pointed me uh, to this, that Shane posted a brilliant um, Facebook um, video about a month and a half ago at Sustainable Reefs in Australia. So I just want to play this, because I think this is really enlightening. So um, just dealing with some sad scollies. And... Um, thought a little bit of light, some light on this dial. Um, stealing some sad corals and uh, I'd just like to share with you something that I've noticed over the years of cutting up corals and scollies especially. One of the reasons that they die the most in aquariums is because of lithophaga boring mussels. Now and I flip this camera around and show you what I mean. So I've cut this and we'll get rid of this irrelevant piece here. You can already see in there, there's a shell of a lithophaga muscle. But on the outside, no sign, nothing. And it's in there and it's dissolving coral tissue. All of them, so it's a half one, I've killed it. All of those are and were lithophagas. Now on the outside, pick where the lithophaga is. Just to go this way. Get off. Born. Get. Right. So there it is. From underneath, it's gigantic. And it comes through there. You didn't really see it from the other side, but there's they're all through it. That one's alive. And it needs to be pulled out. But 
I mean, they further cut that down later, but yeah, they all need trimming out. And when the corals have big rocky bases on them, they have a lot of lithophaga. How they kill the corals is they irritate them. They eat the mucus and feed off the slime of the coral and they irritate it to make it slime, which in turn makes the coral constantly try and repair itself and not put its energy that you're giving it via food and light and nutrients and everything into growing the actual skeleton and the flesh of the coral. It's putting that energy into repairing the damage that that little sucker does. So if you see your corals going backwards and downhill, give them a good trim back and 99 times out of 100, you're going to find a lot of them. I think, you know, to me, it just highlights how cool this industry is. And you could be working in it for so many years and you just come up with absolute pearls of wisdom like that. Um, so I reached out to him and asked him to send me the video because, you know, hopefully you'll equally think it's, it's pretty cool. I literally straight away found uh, a dead skeleton, had no reason or no understanding why this thing died, chopped it in half, sure enough, a massive lithophagon in there. And, you know, I then had a, a pretty sick looking scully at home, trimmed it up, and these pictures are, you know, probably about two, two or three weeks apart, and it's already seeming to be so much happier now I've trimmed this back. So, you know, it's a, it's a brilliant little husbandry tip that, um, yeah, was shared on social media, so thanks, thanks for that. So another species that I've been, um, had a little personal passion about is, is looking at Catalophilia jardinii spawning as well. So a similar process, um, you know, this, I actually ordered some in. So this is giving you a picture of, of how I uh, collected the spawn on this. Um, and you basically you've got these, these buckets, there's four um, brood stock in there. Again, they've been bought in about uh, two months before the natural window that you would expect. And so I simply chuck them in these tanks. They've got a small uh, inlet of water. Um, and there it is, spawning. You know, you can see the, the bundles up here. And then this is material that was produced the, the night before. So rearing the embryos in a real small bucket, this sort of size. Uh, there's settlement media already in there because the, the embryological development is so quick. Um, but they end up producing these massive egg sperm bundles, really messy, messy things with hundreds and hundreds of eggs in. Again, it's a hermaphroditic broadcast spawner, so they are producing eggs and sperm. And in much the same way as the homophilia, I then uh, documented the, the embryological development of that, uh, that species. Um, got really good fertilization, so I haven't done the counts, but it looks to me that's probably up in the high 80s, low 90s, I should think. And you can tell basically, we take these pictures about two hours after the end of fertilization, because that's enough time for the cells to start dividing. And you're simply counting the number of, uh, that are two cells or above versus the ones that are still one cell, and you know that hasn't fertilized. So you can calculate your, your percentage fertilization success from that. Um, they settled really, really well. So I, I had so much material, I settled some at home, I gave a load to Vince and I took tons into work as well at the Horniman and we settled those at the Horniman and we've, we ran a six month study uh, looking at, at growth rates afterwards. So you can see the, the red circles are the, uh, you know, where they're settled on those plugs. By five weeks, they've got the GFPs in them, sort of starting the, the characteristic colors of, of uh, Catalophilia. You can see those uh, sat in their um, little calcium carbonate um, skeletons that are already forming by, by five weeks. And when we image that under blue light and then uh, fluorescent, it really highlights those green fluorescent proteins. Um, by three months old, they're starting to look like a, a little cattle filly, you know, they've, they've got the little characteristic uh, sort of glow torch sort of tips to the tentacles. Um, and I've been really impressed at how quickly uh, these have grown. And I, I really think from a commercial point of view, again, this, this has huge potential, I think, this species. Like I say, in, in uh, Europe, we can't get uh, Australia cattleophilia anymore. It's, it's banned. And it's likely that, we're, that that may not open up. Who knows what will happen? But this provides a, a potentially a new opportunity to, uh, to start spawning them instead. Over the past year, those four broodstock have grown massive. 
And so I'm having to um, think about a different way of approaching spawning this year. They won't fit in a, in a, um, a bucket anymore. But these are just a few of the, the young ones that are reared at home. We've probably got about 100, I think, um, in total across the sites. Sorry, it's a bit laggy. So I've not really cracked this species, but um, played around with it a, a few years ago, looking at um, acans, Micromusa lord howanensis. It's a similar thing that it releases um, a really large egg sperm bundle, uh, one polyp. Again, it's a hermaphroditic broadcast spawner. I got okay settlement, but I didn't manage to rear these on. I'm going to give some examples later of other people that are working with this. Um, so it's a sort of unfinished business. I'm going to come back to this species at some point. And the same of Blastomusa wellsi. So we, we spawned this about three years ago. Um, we had some Indonesian colonies that a friend um, donated to us. And, um, and I think one of the potentials is how beautiful some of the color varieties that, that can come out of these spawning events. And that's some of the, the sort of potential of using sexual reproduction. You never quite know what you're going to get in terms of a color variety. And you know, the tray being driven by fad and you know, a new color morph, potentially sexual reproduction is a, is a route that we could go down. So I'm going to just finish up looking at some of then the unique potential that, that ex situ has. And so once you know um, those environmental parameters, you can then change the types, the timing of what those parameters are doing. And you can do that on lots of different temporal scales. So we know we can shift the corals and make them spawn in our daytime, for instance. If we control that light dark environment, we don't stay up all night long uh, with all the spawnings that we do. We make them spawn in the middle of the day. It fits within our working day. I and mean, we can do all the fertilization, um, you know, fit it around our lunch and tea breaks. I always use the tea break joke because of English. Um, but ultimately, you can get all that fertilization work and then, then clear off home and still have a family life and it not affect you, which is really important from a logistical point of view. We can manipulate the lunar cycles. You know, the apex is so easy. You just change, change a, nu a number. You know, if you want to spawn corals in the day, you just change the clock. If you want to change the, the lunar cycle, just change a number. And the same is true uh, then a, a seasonal scale. If we think about, you know, some of the seasonality, we just have to move it. Uh, wherever we want. I'm going to then give a, a few examples of what we've been doing here. So we now do quite a lot of work with Galaxia fasciculares. It's perhaps not the most attractive coral for an aquarium, and it stings the hell out of everything, but it's a really great species to work, and we're sort of proposing this as a new model organism. Um, it's got a really interesting reproductive biology. So they're not gonagoristic, so they're not truly males and females, but they're also not truly hermaphroditic. What you have is a female that produces a bundle that only has eggs, but the male produces an egg sperm bundle, but the eggs are completely infertile. They're simply there as a buoyancy mechanism to get the sperm up to the surface of where the eggs are. Um, and the thought is that this is sort of an evolutionary stepping stone moving from gonagoristic over to true hermaphroditic species. What we're certainly finding with Galaxia is they become really fecund one year to the next, so we can hit 100% uh, fecundancy from one year to the next. So the colonies we, we're working with, uh, yeah, they're, they're really reliable spawners. They also seem to stagger their spawning over multiple months, which gives you lots of access to material. And there's just a few pictures of, of juveniles that are settled. So what I'm going to sort of try and describe over this is, is an experiment I've been running for about three years to try and disentangle which of those environmental parameters are, are important to trigger these spawning events. So in the top um, graph, uh, this sort of circular graph, zero is um, the 1st of January. And as we travel in an anticlockwise manner around the graph, you're basically moving around the year. So each of those sort of spikes that come off are a spawning observation at a different point throughout the year. And the idea is we want to make it circular rather than linear so that we can compare something that spawned on the 31st of, um, of December to the 1st of January are only one day apart rather than uh, 365 days apart. And so colleagues in Australia gave us some spawning observations um, in situ. And then in this top graph, the only thing we manipulated was temperature. So we kept the photo period lunar cycle the same 
and we're trying to disentangle whether the light dynamics or the temperature dynamics are the things that are driving. And what we see is we get a, a roughly about a one month phase shift if we only manipulate temperature. And that, the, the temperature phase shift that we, we did was about four months. So what it's telling us is the light dynamics is actually doing something as well, so you can't just disentangle one and not do the other. And then the bottom um, example is uh, using then Galaxia, where we took all the environmental data and we phase shifted it by four months, and then in another system we phase shifted it by eight months. And so we have one system that's in sync with the wild, we then have a four month phase shift, and then we have uh, an eight month phase shift. And so ultimately what this is highlighting is we can make coral spawn when we want. So if you have 12 systems, you can theoretically make 12 spawns, or if you're working with Galaxy because it's spawning over multiple months, you could have lots and lots of material. So this has big implications in that productivity and that access to material. And then the last thing I want to sort of um, leave you with is then this idea of once we have those spawning events, why don't we start creating these designer corals? So this is something we've been working on in the coral spawning lab the last couple of years. And it's really taken the lead from the horticultural industry. We see here these tulips of a purple variety, and then you have this sort of blended variety that has red and purple in. So what we've been doing is then taking these spawning events and trying to force these spliced corals or these chimeras, whatever you want to call them. What we know is the corals, when they're larvae, they want to aggregate together. They form these aggregations because they have no immune system when they're very young. So they're not going to fight with each other. And this, it's called the allogeneic response. This has uh, five polyps in. Each one of those polyps is individually genetically um, you know, distinct. And some really interesting stuff is going on here. You've got one and four that are actually rejecting. Where these little stars are, they are not compatible with two, three, and five, those polyps. So lots of things could happen here. Maybe that polyp number one is the dominant and kills the other four. Or it could be that polyp two, three, and five, which are closely enough, they've, they've fused together, um, they could survive, kill the other two, and then you have a chimera that has three genetic uh, material within that one coral. And this is what drives that splicing of a, of a coral. So these are just some examples. We work with a few species. So we've got um, Meliopora, Tenuous, uh, micro, um, uh, Muricata, and, uh, and Liriopes that are showing this exact trait. So this, I think, has a huge potential for the aquarium trade. If you start selectively breeding a new color strain, you could grow that out, sell it into the market, be working with the next color strain the following year and the following year and so on. Um, so hopefully people will pick this up and, and run with it. And then finally, I just want to highlight some work that's going on in Australia. Um, the guys over at Interfish are um, working with LPS spawning. I think this is ultimately, we'll see its way through to market eventually. They're growing them out at the moment. But they've done a, a lovely number of species, trachophilias, uh, you know, the micromusa. And I think this bottom picture, you can just about see, there's the chimera there. So you've got these multiple genetic individuals within a single colony. So these are, this, I think, will be uh, not 100% the future of the trade, but it, it will play a role, I think, as, as we move forward. I've been rambling on for long enough, so I, I need to say thanks to so many people that uh, have supported this work over, over the last 10 years. Companies have supported it with, with products, uh, we've had grants, access to universities, and lots of individuals have played their role. Is Mitch Carl here? Couldn't have been done without Mitch Carl. He's taught me everything I know. <laughs> And thank you for listening. There's information on these websites. If, uh, if you're interested, there's a Facebook group. Uh, we try and share ideas. Anyone has spawning activity, please post it on there. And uh, you know, hopefully we'll build a community. And thank you very much for allowing me to speak and inviting me out here. Thank you.